was really felt that uh, with the way the team was trending that we had to make this change. I'd like to thank Peter Shirelli with his time with the Oilers organization. I know there's people out there that believe this team can't make the playoffs. We believe that we can. 4.07 the time of the goal that has given the Oilers a two-goal cushion again. Now that cushion evaporates. Out in front, Patrick scores! Nolan Patrick wins it in overtime. Here's Jeremiah Whiteside, cuts back. The eyes that shoot, scores! What a tough two days for the Edmonton Oilers. I really believe a lot of the solution is right inside the dressing room. Our fans have seen it. They just want us to be much more consistent. Here's an opportunity for Kruger. Right out in front, John Hayden scores. Dylan Strome waits, lets it go, he scores. They look for more. A rebound in front. Kane with a shot, he scores. That's four goals in the first six and a half minutes of period three. Fans here at Rogers Place voicing their displeasure. Uh, what's it feel like to be Conor McDavid right now? <laughs> ah. I'm not even going to answer that. You know how I feel. It's frustrating. Thanks. They're only three points out of a playoff spot. Yeah, but that doesn't make a competitor like that any less. Oh, are you? Uh, yeah. No, and and I am not in, uh, trying to insinuate that that's the case. Yeah, like, just so be I'm clear, for a guy like him and a guy like Leon Drysaddle putting up numbers and not being able to get wins and not being able to close out games and not like having good 40 minutes. But that wasn't even, I don't even know if you would classify that as close, not being able to close out. Like, I don't know what you classify that last night as, but yeah. that's as unique as you can possibly get. But hey. Five third period goals for the first time since January 2008. First time at home since 1993. I thought another word was coming out when I saw when I heard F. Not that you are that person. First time? I heard, I, cause it, and and I, I would not have blamed you if that was the case, reading some of the stats. John Shannon is joining us from Casa Shannon. Wouldn't do that, you say. Hello, <laughs> Hello John. Hi, boys. How are you? I'm good. good. John, when you leave, let's say you're at Roger's uh, place last night, and you're going to your car. Are you <laughs> thinking to yourself, what was that? Or we're three points out of a playoff spot. Well, uh, first of all, it's so cold at Edmonton, I'm starting my block heater. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then I'm saying, man, oh, man, what was that? And you know what? We're still only three points out of the playoffs. And I, I think that that's the conundrum that everybody's in in Edmonton. Uh, I, 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 th I think there isn't one person outside of the city that doesn't feel their pain. I mean, it, it is an absolute frustration. Um, and and it, the way I would describe it in so many ways, guys, uh, and you saw it at a, to a little extent in Philly, you saw it to the same extent in Montreal in the overtime games, and certainly third period against Chicago, but the emotional collapse, it's almost like those three teams, the Flyers, the Canadians, and the Blackhawks, come back and tie it, and the sag on the bench, the sag on the ice, is something that this group cannot get over, and I and I don't know how to explain it otherwise. You know, you know, in the press conference, Bob Nicholson said there's something in the water. Uh, I would suggest that the emotional state, the fragility of this team right now, uh, is such that uh, you know having that two-one lead or the four-two lead, and the inability to keep it going is absolutely amazing. I know social media has changed this. Terry Jones has been on, around for a while. He said that was as ghastly as it gets in his column today. Um, we're on the verge of, what, 12 of 13 seasons without the playoffs. Where, where's the level of anger among the fan base? Well, I, I mean, I think it's intense. I, I, I think that, uh, and, you know, we've talked about it many times on this show and, and on other shows. Uh, that this is a fan base that has a, a a much greater correspondence with the hockey club than most other cities, uh, particularly the big cities in Canada. This is this is not a corporate dollars town. This is uh, hardworking people in northern Alberta, not just in the city, but you know, in Grand Prairie and Vegreville and Fort Saskatchewan and and Leduc and and even in Red Deer that drive all the way to Edmonton to watch their hockey team play and spend their own money to watch them play, uh, and they haven't been able to produce this year. It, it, it truly is frustrating. 70% of their fan base is not corporate. It's, it's the, real th the real deal. It's the, it's the fan that 
lives and dies with this hockey club and has done the same since they joined the NHL in 1979. So uh, it, it, I can only imagine how frustrating it is for every one of those fans. I, I guess people in Toronto would understand it to a certain extent when you consider uh, how poor the Maple Leafs were for years at, at certain points in certain decades. Uh, but this is getting pretty close to that. Is there a point where, where that fan base, I mean, they've fired a lot of people here. Is there a point where that <laughs> fan base says to Daryl Case, like, who's left to fire? Do you go over the, like, is it culture? Do you have to go after the old guard, of, like Mac T or Kevin Lowe have been around for, like, how far can they go? Uh, that's a great question. But uh, at the same time, and I, I don't see Kevin Lowe involved day to day. I mean, I think Kevin Lowe is in the in the company. I think Kevin Lowe has a role to play within Rogers Place. Uh, but Kevin's not involved day to day in, in hockey operations. Uh, and, and so in, in many ways, it's, it's unfair to paint him with this brush. Uh, to me, in many ways, this one's on the players at a certain point. Uh, and and we know the numbers that Connor has, brilliant. Leon Dreisaitl, brilliant. Uh, but there are other guys that have let them down, and and that's the frustration. You know, the first period in Philadelphia on Saturday, guys, was as good as they played. And that's why this turnaround so quickly, six periods later, and we're talking about one of the worst periods they've played all season long, uh, is is one that is numbing. Uh, and I, I really think it's numbing for everybody. I think it's numbing for the coaching staff. It's numbing for management uh, and certainly numbing for the players. John, when you when, when you watch how, how bewildering this team can be on the ice at times and you look at the standings, how do you decipher what role they play between now and the trade deadline of February 25th? I have no idea what their role is. Well, I think there's a practical side to this. Um, you know, if they get in, Connor's going to have to go to another level. Leon's going to have to go to another level. And they're going to have to get some goaltending. You know, Cam Talbot's going to have to play better. And Miko Koskinen's going to have to play better. Um, you know, Oscar Kleffbaum coming back against Chicago is a positive. But, it you know, he hasn't played for more than 20 games. So he's going to have to be better. Uh, Darnell Nurse being put on that second line, a second uh, defensing pair with Chris Russell. He's going to have to play better. Uh, Adam Larson's going to have to play better. This is going to be a team effort uh, beyond the superstars. You know, the, the 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 fascination is is that the numbers. If you if if you came from another planet and looked at the NHL scoring leaders and looked at Drysaitel and McDavid and the in the scoring leaders to say, man, this is a good team. Um, but the drop off is so. I'm going to use a big word here, guys. I, be ready. Precipitous. Um, that What's this that's, got to do with rain. Well, it's raining at my house. I don't know what your place for you. Um, you know, but it, it's so the, the drop is so deep that that's the scary part. I um, mean, Milan Lucic ha, has played better now that he's alongside of Connor McDavid, uh, but has he played well enough? Ty Raddy being given an opportunity to play alongside those two has contributed a little bit, but at the same time, you have to play for 60 minutes. You can't play until you know Nolan Patrick gets the puck in front of the net in overtime in Philadelphia. Those are things the consistency has to happen and that consistency has to come from the players, not necessarily from management. So now you've got I mean we see the lines tweeted out today from practice. You got Tobias Reader who has zero goals going on the top line with Connor McDavid and Leon Drysaddle. He's, he's due, Tim. Sid, he is, he's very due. Sid and I were sitting here having the same conversation about how they get better. The only answer I had was Miko Koskinen and Cam Talbot stealing games, which they've done for maybe like 3% of the time. For the, Like, how does this, how do they fix this? Like, he's, Bob Nicholson said it was in the room. I'm looking around. I don't know that it's in that room. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, based on everything that goes on with this hockey club and the cap situation, what other choice they have at this point? Right. Uh, and 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 really, you know, the changing of the lines today, um, they had tried to maintain some consistency for the three games, uh, but the fact that McDavid and Drysital click so well and their numbers are so effective to, when they're together is really, at this point, the only thing that's happening. The, the, the only console they have in all this, guys, is that Colorado's going through this same issue. Anaheim's going through this same issue. 
Vancouver's got some major injuries now. Miku Koivu got injured with Minnesota last night. He's out for the season. St. Louis is the only team that seems to have at the peaked at the right time, being right now. Uh, and who know who knows how long that'll last. So the, we're actually contemplating now in the Western Conference after all these points and everybody talks about 95, 96 points getting into the playoffs. We might be talking about 83 and 82 points getting into the playoffs. And that goes back to that famous line out of one of your favorite movies, is there's still a chance. Dumb and Dumber. You're telling well, me there's still a chance. It's true. There's still a chance. Why did you assume Dumb and Dumber was one of my favorite movies, John? Well, no, both of ours. Because you're right. Both, He's both, suggesting, yeah. yeah. Love that yeah, movie. Yeah. So wh- yeah. who, who's sure. dumber? Pardon me? You know what I'm asking. Who's dumber? <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> You're right. We'll talk about it. Oh, by the way, I know I'm going to steal some time here. Okay. So, okay, let me play this for you. Oh, no. Where is this going? Technology. Technology and stuff. Okay. John is right now. And uh, I'm being chased by, I believe, it's John Shannon. Oh, John, let me explain. Yeah. Let me explain. That? Let me explain. John, what is that? that? So that, that was, hold on, hold on. For those that didn't see, on, if, if they couldn't see to... it, it was, it was Sid uh, superimposed on George Costanza in, yeah. an, in a wheelchair, a, yeah. a, a moving yeah. wheelchair, and he yeah. said that John Shannon was chasing him. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. 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 I used to, I used to have a place on this show. I used to be the global ambassador. Mm-hmm. You know, and now I'm, you know, made mockery of uh, in, in an in a, in a electric chair. Listen. You know? Well, it wasn't. Hold on, it wasn't an electric chair. Um, John, first off, it wasn't I, an electric chair. Just in not a way, that but just I don't like how he phrased yeah, it. Right. John, first off, I take responsibility for everything I say on this show. I consider you a dear friend. <laughs> Secondly, producer Thomas Dobby made me say this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what John Shannon. Yeah. By the way, how it got on his phone is a whole other story. But that's me, <laughs> right. and that is John Shannon. Wait, 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 wait. So, so I was told to I, say by the producers of the show. So chasing I, here, me. Here, 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 here's the major thing, guys. Uh, somebody actually had to send to me because that would be the only way I would have to watch. <laughs> oh, snap. Now he's You've been this for stuff. years. People the, don't the, know. Here, it. Here's the crazy part, John, is that you're like you're acting like this mockery is new. Like even when you were at the height <laughs> of your global ambassador dream. Yeah. Yeah, Second verse same it. as the first there, John. <laughs> yeah, it's the same man, thing. you got to be able to give it, and you got to be able to take it, baby. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? This was more fun than watching an Oilers third period. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Something to be said for that. There you go. Love you. John Shannon joining us as always. Uh, he mocks us because he loves, I think. Is, it, is he still the global ambassador? Yeah, he's always been the global ambassador. When you're ambassadoring, what is it? Ambassadry? What is that? Ambas- Amb- ambassador. Ambassador sounds like a medical condition I want no part of. <laughs>